Hi guys, so this is going to be a very dark and very real story. Um, I wanted to go over what has happened in my life uh, since my last video. So, um, this year, I, I mean 2015, I haven't had much of any luck. Um, I haven't had much luck with employment. Um, I think the last time I made a video, I was talking about a graphics card I had gotten, or it was a transit-related video. It was made during a time where I was employed. Um, this year, I've had five jobs, and I've lost all of them. For reasons that are not directly related to me, um, more or less situations that were... Um, situations that were outside of my control. Um, I've lost one job for having a respiratory infection. This was last April. I've lost a job due to budget cuts. I lost a job because I didn't sign a piece of paper. Um, I've lost a job because I didn't take a drug test within 24 hours when I was told it would be 48 hours. Um, and just recently I lost a job because I was hospitalized. So, yeah, there are two situations that I probably could have avoided, um, but the rest were not, they were not, I could not avoid them. So, I'm just going to be blunt and frank. Um, I tried to kill myself on New Year's Eve. And I'm not proud of it. And the way I tried to kill myself is by overdosing on sleeping pills. These are three bottles. I actually had five bottles with me um, on December 31st. Uh, they're all Walmart brand sleeping pills. I had 128 sleeping pills ready to go. That is 6,400 milligrams of diphenhydramine, I think that's, I don't know how to really pronounce it, but it's the, as you can see, it's the uh, main active ingredient, which is kind of blurry. But um, I had bottles of sleeping pills ready to kill myself. Um, for anyone who's asking why, um, it's because there's multiple reasons why I tried to kill myself. But I'm not going to dive into every single reason. Um, the main reasons was I had just recently gotten a job. I got it about two weeks before Christmas. I started the week before Christmas. Um, and I liked the job. It was, it was a job that would have allowed me to really further my career and move more into a managerial role um, versus being the grunt worker. And I really saw a bright future with that company. Um, they're well known out here in Las Vegas. I'm not gonna say who it is um, out of just the, you know, out of respect for them as well as respect for myself. But I lost my job because I was hospitalized. I was hospitalized twice. First time was for calling a suicide hotline. Um, I have called the suicide hotline in the past year and a half about 10 times. And it's the same one. It's known as Trevor, which is a LGBT uh, suicide hotline. Um, and their job is to kind of talk to you and, and uh, kind of help you out, help you gather your thoughts, and to kind of help you convince, convince yourself not to do it. Um, and I've thought of multiple ways to kill myself. I've thought about hanging myself. I've thought about overdosing on pills, which is the only suicide attempt I've ever had was overdosing on pills. Um, on Christmas night, I had called the suicide hotline because it was my first Christmas away from family. It was my first Christmas where I called people and they never picked up. And I allowed that to get the better of me. And I... I, I can't blame anyone else for that. Um, at the end of the day, even though my family can be assholes, 
um, and I have to be very blunt about that, that they are assholes. Um, I, I should not have called the suicide hotline that day. Because every time you call a suicide hotline, you get a different agent, or volunteer as they call them. And they've never called the police on me before. You know, they knew where I lived, they knew my address, they knew my phone number. Um, but they've never called the police on me. This time was different. So, at around 7.30 at night, I get a banging on my door. And there's two police officers show up at my door asking for me. And... I let them in the house. They tell me why they're here. They're here because someone felt I was unsafe for myself. And they told me that regardless of what is said, I'm going to a hospital tonight. That's what they said to me. They were putting me in what's known as an L2K, which is a, a law that Nevada gives, like it's, it's power that they give to therapists, police, psychologists and doctors um, that they can legally detain you because they feel you're a danger to yourself. Um, and the problem with that, and that's something I'm gonna brush over, is they don't have to prove it. They don't have to prove that you're unsafe to yourself. They can, it, it's really one of those guilty until proven innocent kind of ordeals. And the police officers, against their better judgment, even though I explained to them that by detaining me and forcing me to go to a hospital, um, that would kill my career. It would literally kill the job I had just gotten. I explained that to them. I, I mean, for 40 minutes, I was trying to convince them that I'm not a danger to myself and that I've never attempted a suicide and I don't even have the supplies to kill myself. Um, so they said, well, I have a track record of never allowing anyone to die, so I don't want to lose that, and I can't trust you. That's what he said. Even though I had a roommate here who could, you know, prevent me from doing just that. So against my will, they detained me. They put me in an ambulance, and they sent me to the hospital. They sent me to UMC, which is a hospital here in Las Vegas. So I'm at UMC, I explained to the doctor that I'm not a danger to myself. He said, okay, I have to just concur with another doctor, the, the senior staff here, and once they make their call, we can release you. So I explained the same story to the other doctor. He said, well, I don't have the feeling that you're not going to hurt yourself. So I'm going to, we're gonna move forward with sending you to a facility so that they can help you. Again, they want to help me. It's, they're providing unwanted help is really what they are doing. So I was brought to a facility where I spent from uh, December 26th all the way to December 30th. I was in this facility. I missed three days of work. I had called on Monday, made sure that they knew where I was. I, I didn't give them any details. I didn't tell them I was suicidal. I just said, I'm in the hospital and I'm hoping to be out soon. Um, when I was released, I, you know, they felt that I wasn't a danger to myself anymore and they released me. Now the hospital, by the way, is uh, a very shitty place. Um, it's a mental facility. And they treat you like a criminal. You're not allowed to have a cell phone. You're not allowed to have like an underwire bra. Like they're extremely strict. You're not even allowed to have shoelaces. You're not allowed to have a necklace. You're not allowed to have anything. And it's when they decide that you're ready that you get to go home. It's not something that you can make a conscious decision. It's not something that they give you literally no power. It really comes down to are you participating in all the group therapies? Are you you know, expressing any sort of sorrow. Like they, they really like, they're checking on you every 15 minutes. Every fucking 15 minutes, they come into the bedroom with a flashlight to your face, um, making sure you're still breathing. Um, so I was released from the facility and I was, um, my computer just flashed. 
I was uh, released from the facility. I go to work on Thursday, last Thursday, which was uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve. Um, I go to work, my computer is locked, and when I go to unlock it, it says account disabled, which usually means you're fired. Um, I've worked in IT for long enough that that's really what happens. So I'm sitting there for about an hour, and my coworker comes over and gets me and says, hey, well, um, we need to go to HR. They've requested you for a meeting. So I was brought to HR, and I met with the director of HR as well as the VP of IT. And they sat me down and they said, look, Metro Police Department contacted us because they were worried for you. They felt that you were suicidal and that they needed to know where you lived. So we gave them your address. So Metro Police had said the night that they came here that it was very hard to track me down. But me being a dumbass, I told the suicide hotline where I worked and I should never have done that. Um, so they gave that to the police and that was the only lead that the police had. Um, because Las Vegas is a big place. Um, they can't go door to door to find out where I live. So I honestly think they should have just called T-Mobile and asked them because they had my phone number. They could have just asked T-Mobile, hey, where the fuck does this person live? Um, and honestly, that would have been better for me because then my job would never have learned that I was suicidal. So they said that they wanted to give me the rest of the week to just relax and that they were going to think about what they can do. Can they let me go or are they going to let me work there? And I said, look, you know, I really like working here. I just started two weeks ago. You know, I'm doing really well. I was forced against my will into a hospital. And I told them, I said, look, I fought hard to not go so I can go to work. I told them that I valued my job more than my own life, and I did. Um, so I was released um, from my job. I, I got in my car, and I just, I, I think I snapped. I really think I did, because the first thing I thought of was go to Walgreens. I went to Walgreens. They had a buy one, get one free sale, or a buy one, get one half off sale. So I went to two different Walgreens and purchased two sleeping pill bottles in each. And they're 32 tablets each. So I purchased four. I had a fifth bottle here, but that was for normal insomnia. I just couldn't sleep, so I would take it just to knock me out. Um, and they didn't think anything. Be again, because it was a buy one, get one half off sale, they figured I was just stocking up. They didn't think anything of it. If I went to buy four of them at one place, that would have raised some red flags. So I got home, I popped the lids off of every single bottle and they have a little safety seal and I cracked all the safety seals and I dumped them because they fill them up to like about a quarter of the way. So I dumped the other bottles into one. I have one and a half bottles. And I just couldn't really push myself to do it. I couldn't push myself to kill myself. I, I just sat there and I cried and I just, I just couldn't push myself to kill myself. So I called the Trevor hotline. I called the very same people that just put me in this predicament. And after about two and a half hours of crying and you know blaming them for all my problems, I started taking pills. Um, and it got easier and easier with each pill. And I made it up to about 24 before I well, actually, I took four and then I took 20 in one, one gulp. And the moment I took the 20, I immediately went into regret. I immediately was like, what the fuck did I just do? That was the feeling I had. I, I just, I really regretted what I did. So I immediately ran to the bathroom and started gagging, um, trying to force myself to throw it up. And I couldn't. I tried very hard, and trust me, I don't like throwing up. I really hate throwing up. That's why I take a lot of Pepto-Bismol for my stomach problems, um, because I do not like throwing up. But this, I wanted to throw up the pills. I wanted to get them out of my system. Um, so after about 15 minutes of trying to get them out and crying and worried, and I'm still on the phone with the suicide hotline, by the way, um, 
they kept asking me, what, what's your address? What's your address? And I gave them no identifiable information. I even blocked my phone number when I called them because I didn't want the police to come. I didn't want to be saved. That was my initial thing. But I quickly unlocked the door for the police so they didn't have to break down the door. I um, changed into clothes that I knew that I could wear at the mental health facility because I hated wearing their clothes. Um, and I told them my address. I said, this is where I live. You know, I don't want to die. And at that point, it was really starting to kick in. Um, the first thing I started noticing is my heart was pounding very hard. Um, I got immediately weak. I felt like my body was a thousand pounds. Like I, I just could not, for the life of me, get on my legs. My legs were completely shot. And I was crawling around the floor and it was hard. It was very hard for me to crawl and I crawled from my bathroom to my living room. And it took about 20 minutes between when I told the facility where I live to the point that police and ambulance came. And during that time, I started blacking out. I couldn't even carry a conversation on. I would, after five seconds, I would lose track of my train of thought. I would lose track of the conversation I was having. We would talk about something and I would go, I, yeah, this is, and I would just blank out and then he'd be like, Catherine, Catherine, Catherine. I was like, oh, what? Like, I just kept zoning out. And even though I was still able to see, my entire thought process was shot. Um, and my, my eyesight started pulsating. So it felt like everything was kind of getting brighter and darker, like pulsating. Um, and again, my heart, oh my God, like I've never felt my heart pound so hard. So the police came and at that point I was just so out of it. And they had asked me, you know, where my wallet was. So I pointed to my purse. Um, and they, I happened to still have my phone in my hand and, um, I hung it up when the police came and they're like, Oh, can you walk to the stretcher? And I'm like, I can't walk. So they, they lifted me up and put me in the stretcher and I really don't have much memory after that. So I can remember being in the ambulance. I can like very little, they kept trying to keep me awake and conscious. Um, so they kept asking me repetitive questions like, what's your birthday? Who are you? Where are you? Like they kept trying to make sure I was conscious about what was going on, but I kept zoning out. I couldn't help it. I felt powerless. Um, so then the next thing I can remember, like, cause I have no memory of arriving to the ER room. I don't have any memory. Um, that's all completely blank. I have, I just don't. Um, the next thing I remember was being in the hospital bed and, um, Actually, I remember being transferred to the hospital bed. It's hard. Like sometimes a memory pops in my head that I didn't remember before. Um, and then I remember them uh, sticking me with an IV in my arm. Like I still have black and blue right here. Um, but they stuck me with an IV in this arm. Uh, apparently they drew my blood. I didn't know that until later because they're like, oh, your blood test results came back. And I'm like, you didn't take my blood, but apparently they did. I have no memory of it. Um, so they were giving me fluids and then they gave me this charcoal drink shake thing. And I, the problem was every time, like the only thing I can remember was they gave it to me. I drank a little bit of it. It was nasty as fuck. But then what would happen is the bottles open and I remember it had a lid like this and there was a straw. So I drink it and then I kept, zoning out and you see my hand kept flopping over and I met and I would spill a whole bunch on me and then I would like come back to consciousness and I'll be like you know like I was just so out of it so I just couldn't talk I really I wasn't coherent but I kept spilling it on myself <laughs> and that I mean I, I laugh at it because it was just funny they had white sheets and there's just this charcoal shit everywhere um, I had it all over my legs and stuff. So at one point they take me to, um, to uh, pee in a cup so they could figure out what was in me. I could not walk, so they had to push me in a wheelchair. They had to ca like carry me out of the bed, put me in a wheelchair, and then wheel me over to a bathroom. I peed in the cup. Um, of course the toxology report comes back clean because I didn't take any illegal drugs. All I did was take these. 
Um, so after that, I very I really don't have much memory. I remember having to pee, and they gave me a portable urinal, um, which was like not my dignity just was kind of gone at that point. Um, but at one point, a doctor came up to me, and I remember this. He said, you know, what happened? And I said, well, I tried to kill myself with sleeping pills. And he goes, well, there's, here's a story of a 16-year-old girl who overdosed on Tylenol to kill herself. But then she didn't want to die afterwards. She had the regret, but she ended up killing her liver. So she had 10 days to live. And at that point, my heart's racing. I'm like, oh, shit, did I, like, do that to myself? Did I, you know, kill my liver and, you know, really kill myself? And they said, no, your liver functions are fine. The blood tests just show the elevated liver functions, but you'll be fine. Um, I had a total of three blood tests while I was in the hospital. Um, and... When I was in the, they had the psych ward kind of section where they keep the L2K people waiting to be transferred to a mental hospital. I was there from um, December 31st up until um, December 2nd, late night December 2nd. And being there was hell because I really couldn't do anything for those days. Like I could barely walk and um, I just had to lay in bed. There was no TVs, there were no, I mean, there was a TV, but you really couldn't see it. It was up on the wall and it doesn't have IPS, so you can't see anything. Um, and the nurses there were like nasty people. Um, this one woman was just such a bitch to me. Um, so they took more blood because in order to release me to the mental facility, my white blood cell count had to be back to normal. Um, so after, on, on the second, that's when the blood test result said I was good. And trust me, I hate blood tests, but I wanted to get out of that hospital ASAP. Like, I hated being in that hospital. So I was brought back to the mental facility. And by the way, in the mental facility, I was discriminated against. I never mentioned this. But they wouldn't allow me to have a roommate because I'm transgender. Even though my legal sex is female, they wouldn't allow me to have a roommate because I'm trans. And that's actually illegal. Um, and that's something that I'm actually going to pursue. Um, so while I was in the hospital, and this is why I have my computer here, the police left my door unlocked. And you can imagine what happened. So when Erica came home, she said, yeah, stuff was all like thrown around and she thought I had done it. Well, it turns out, we were robbed. Um, the police left the door unlocked, and we can prove this, because there's three keys. I had a key, Erica has a key, and the front office has a key. My purse was not with me in the hospital. Instead, only my wallet and my cell phone was. So the fucking asshole who robbed me had my purse, which had my key and had my car key fucking assholes and also had my birth certificate those bastards but luckily the birth certificate was no longer valid because it had been amended already so the amended ones are with my lawyer um so they stole my sony vio laptop the white one they stole my sony vio dual 11 ultrabook which was in the windows 10 video i did um they stole my canon rebel t5 camera and all of the lenses it was all in a bag they stole my Galaxy Tab 10.5. They stole my Galaxy Note Edge. They stole my iPhone 6 Plus, the old version, not the one that I'm using to record. They stole my Xbox One, and that had the Rise of the Tomb Raider inside it, and they stole two Xbox One controllers. They stole my Beats Pill, and then they stole my Dooney and Bork Nylon Crossbody Purse. Um, and I'll actually show you guys that now. So this is my Dooney and Bork um, purse. And 
I mean, it's not cheap. It's like $130. But of all the things, they had to steal my purse. So luckily for me, and I mean, it's really nice on the inside. It's a very nice, it's nylon, so it's not leather or anything. And it has a lifetime warranty, and these are real leather straps and stuff. Um, they stole this, and the thing is, it has attached to it, which I have to like get this purse all broken in. It has the key to my car and the key to my apartment. So one of the first things we did was change the locks. Um, but luckily, Macy's still has this purse. I bought this November of 2014. My parents actually gave me a $100 gift card for Christmas, so I used that to repurchase my purse because I did not, I love this purse. And it's one of those things where, I guess it's just a girl thing, where this is kind of personal. And I felt very violated about the purse. Everything else, I'm not so worried about because they're not personal. You know, they're, they're technology. And me, as a tech person, I'm constantly changing devices. So it wasn't, there was no sentimental value to the things that were stolen. I'm pissed that they're stolen. Don't get me wrong. But I was more actually crying and upset because this was stolen. And the thing was, in this pocket, in here, was my birth certificate. Um, which is not in this one, obviously. But what's kind of freaky is because this is the exact same style, exact same color straps, everything, and because I kept my purse in meticulous condition, um, I, it just, it scares me because stuff is missing. My like makeup and all that stuff, which, you know, I keep like eyeliner pencils and I keep um, like colored lip gloss. So, you know, it's just weird, but my, my wallet and stuff was with me, luckily, um, because that would have really sucked. So here's where the new part comes, is that the police, because they left my door unlocked and because I didn't have my purse with me, and the purse was stolen, the purse is not here. We've searched every nook and cranny of our apartment. It's not here. We've already talked to the, the hospital. They don't have it. Um, when you go and you're checked into an L2K or in the hospital, they do an itemized report of what was with you. Um, so all they had was my wallet and my cell phone. That's it. Um, so again, we immediately changed the locks. So all in all, it was about $7,400 worth of stuff that was stolen. Um, that's just a rough estimate. Like it's not to the exact dollar amount, but it's pretty close. Um, I remember a lot of what I buy and I remember how much I paid for it. Plus I have all the receipts online um, for most of the stuff because I bought it online. I buy a lot of my stuff with Amazon. Um, so I was released from the facility yesterday um, and it was hard to come home and, and see that a lot of stuff is missing. Um, on my bed I had two laptops and they're not there anymore. So I've actually moved my whole computer. It's now in my bedroom um, because Erica now wants the computer room as her bedroom. That's fine. Um, so now I have a computer in my bedroom again, so it kind of feels normal. Um, I like to lay down and watch Netflix, that's my thing. So this asshole who stole my stuff stole everything I used to watch Netflix in bed. So I was forced to watch it on a cell phone, and it's not the same thing. I'm used to watching it on a 16-inch screen, or the, the Galaxy Tab 10.5, I bought that just to watch Netflix because it has an OLED display, and I like watching my movies on there. It was just gorgeous. But luckily, I have a nice 27-inch widescreen. Now, that's the funny thing. The thief never got to the point where they started stealing stuff, so they didn't steal, like, my MX Master. Um, they didn't steal anything. Luckily, my Apple Watch which is the funny part. My Apple Watch was actually in the bathroom because I was wearing it when I overdosed on the pills. So I left it on the counter in my small bathroom. The thief never checked. And I'm kind of glad because this thing is not cheap. This is a $700 watch. Um, so at this point, what I have done, because again, I'm gonna try to see if I have any legal recourse against the police for negligence. Um, I can't really discuss much about what I'm gonna do, 
but I don't know if they can be held accountable or not. I'm actually doing my research and doing my due diligence and trying to figure it out because at the end of the day, they, they left my door open. They left it unlocked. Um, when, er when Erica came home, the, she said the door was actually cracked open. Um, so it's one of those things where if the police would have locked the door, we would never have been robbed. Someone just took advantage of an opportunity. I mean, what thief wouldn't fucking do it? If you see and you're watching, maybe it's one of the other neighbors I have in this facility, but if honestly, if you're a thief and you're watching this video, don't tell me you wouldn't take advantage of that situation where you see that a bunch of police had just left, they didn't lock the door, so the first thing you're gonna do is check it. And you know, bravo, thank you for fucking stealing my shit. Um, so what I did, and there's gonna be a link below if you've actually managed to watch it to this point. This is a very long video. But I started a GoFundMe. Um, just, I'm gonna lower the amount because I know that asking for $7,400 is really asking for way too much. Honestly, all I really want at this point, if, if people can donate to me, I just want enough to replace my laptop, uh, replace the key to my car, um, get another Xbox One, and get another camera. That's all I really want at this point. <laughs> You know, like the Galaxy Note Edge, I'm not too worried about. The Galaxy Tab, I'm annoyed, but it's not one of those absolute must-haves. Um, but, you know, as I said, really the purse, I had to buy another one because it was really very personal to me. And, you know, like Erica kept telling me like, oh, just, just get another purse, you know, get a cheapo one. Fuck no, I wanted the same one. It's, it feels... It feels like this is my same purse. I feel like I never lost it, and I'm glad because I just, as I said, being being robbed is not a fun experience. It was actually one of my greatest fears growing up. I always worried that one day I was gonna come home after a vacation or something and just not have anything. Um, I knew people who had been robbed. I was friends with people who had been robbed, and from what they had told me years ago, it is a horrible experience to go through. And I'm honestly very surprised that I haven't gone back and purchased more bottles and tried to kill myself a second time. Um, I'm honestly using this not as a wake-up call, but as a challenge. That life really kicked me to the curb. It really kicked me down. And, you know, people took advantage of me when I was in a very bad place. Um, but I'm looking at it in this perspective that if there's anyone out there who watches my videos who is willing to donate a dollar or two, again, don't do it unless you absolutely want to. Um, as I said, it's not the end of the world. You know, I kind of consider myself a spoiled person when it comes to technology. It's all I ever really spend my money on and it just sucks that they took so much all at once so I just want to be able to purchase another laptop for myself. That's one of the most important things I need to buy right now. Um, actually, scratch that. The most important thing is to buy another key fob because they're like $400. Um, and then they charge you a fee to reprogram the, cor the car. So that's honestly the first thing I have to replace. And luckily I got a two week severance. So I'm gonna use that to take care of that key lock because um, that, that I cannot leave alone. Um, but again, the link will be below to my GoFundMe. Again, only, only donate if you absolutely want to and if you absolutely can. Um, I don't want people like saying, oh, I love you so much. Or, like, I don't think I have fans like that, you know? And this is the very first time I'm honestly ever asking for money. Um, again, it's not, it's not dire. It's not, um, it's not the end of the world if I don't get any donations. That's not the issue. It's just more or less kind of to bring a little bit of normalcy to my life would be to be able to replace a few of the things. Um, I'm not planning on replacing everything. Um, I think that losing them maybe put it, things into perspective. But again, as I said, I haven't been without a laptop since I was in high school. So it's been over 10 years since I've been without a laptop and it sucks, it really sucks. But again, 
put things into perspective, at least I have a roof over my, my head, I'm still alive. And I think this entire experience has really put things into perspective that, you know, when the going got really tough for me, yeah, I thought that suicide was an option. Um, but I realize it really isn't. It's very hard to kill yourself. And I think the people who have killed themselves, you know, my heart goes out to them. My heart goes out to the people who successfully ended themselves, ended their lives. And I don't think people should be angry with them. I don't think people should say, oh, they're going to hell or anything of the sort. It takes a lot of courage to kill yourself. And I know firsthand because I tried. And I gave it a decent shot. Yeah, I could have downed the entire bottle. But after about 24 pills, I don't know, something just clicked. Something just told me that I, I shouldn't die. I really need to try to live. And I honestly went into a panic when I took the 24. I didn't even take a whole bottle's worth, but I had four bottles worth of pills ready to kill myself. And if I would have taken all four bottles, I would have died. There is no doubt about it. I would have went through cardiac arrest and I would have died. There is no doubt about it. Um, so that's just an update on everything, guys. It's, um, it's 2016. I want to thank everybody who has stuck through all the videos. I want to thank everybody who, you know, sees some sort of value in me because it's hard for me to see it in myself. It's hard for me to, to look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm pretty. You know, it's hard for me. I think I look like absolute shit right now. My hair is not even done. This is what my hair normally looks like when I don't flat iron it. Um, so I'm gonna actually do that. I'm gonna actually, after this video, I'm gonna take a nice hot bath. I deserve that at least from all the shit I've been through. Um, and I'm trying to get my life back on track. I'm trying to find another job. Luckily it's first quarter of the year. So that's when companies are really in the hiring spirit. So my odds of getting a job is actually really good. Um, versus being laid off in the fourth quarter. I was laid off October 30th, and it took me a month and a half before I found another job. So I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to try my best to get another job because at the end of the day, I want to keep a roof over my head. I want to I wanna survive. And that's not something I could have said before. Before I was very mopey, I was very depressed. I wanted nothing more than to die. I would just cry all the time. And I don't know, it's kind of, this experience has been, I guess a blessing in disguise because if you look at it face value, it fucking sucks. It really sucks. You know, have being robbed, you know, going to the hospital, it sucks. And then losing my job on top of it. Like I found out today I lost my job. So it's just, <sighs> you know, it sucks. But I think at the end of the day, I'm in some very bizarre way. I'm kind of glad that I experienced what it's like to try to kill yourself so that I understood what it means to be alive. And that's a life lesson that I, I don't think many people go through. Um, I think when people have near-death experiences, this I feel like was a near-death experience for me, even though I probably had no chance in hell killing myself on 24 pills, but I this is the first time I've ever been hospitalized for an actual medical emergency. I've been playing it pretty safe throughout my life. I've never broken a bone in my body. You know, I've never been hit by a car. I've never been in a car accident. I mean, for the most part, I've been, I've had it pretty good. Um, so the only time I've actually been in any sort of true danger was when I put myself in danger. And, you know, it was a really foolish thing to do. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm alive. I'm glad that that I have my health. I didn't do any serious permanent damage to my body and I'm, I'm glad I didn't um, because it was a really stupid thing for me to do to try to kill myself. So thanks everybody for watching this very, very long video, but 
I don't know. Like I, as I said, it, it's been a very rough road for me. So thank you guys. And you know, I hope 2016 works out better for me. And I hope that I can get back to a regular, like fun and, you know, ranty kind of YouTube videos again. Bye guys. Thank you for all your support and thank you for sticking through everything.